Hey YouTubers, it's Charlie. This week on Quora, things totally got real. So there are two more episodes. They haven't really said whether or not they're going to post that at the same time or if it's just going to be one episode per week for the next two weeks. I'll be sure to update with more information, but Janet Varney and some of the cast were talking about how this season's finale is going to be different from books one and two. So after we get through top five WTF moments and my review, I'll explain what they said. If you're finding me for the first time, I do Quora videos every week. I even do a weekly giveaway. All you have to do to enter that is be a subscriber and leave a comment on this video. I know a lot of you are asking too, and as soon as Quora goes off the air, I will do more bonus videos, but then Fridays is probably going to be when Star Wars Rebels is going to air in October. So that's just going to be my new Friday animated show that I'll do videos for. Careful for spoilers from episode 11 if you haven't seen it yet, but here are my top five WTF moments. I'll wait just a second. Okay, ready? Here we go. Number five, Chaos and Bossing Say. I didn't expect Sahir to actually kill the Earth Queen, but it looks like that's what happened, which is also bad news for the ending in this episode. But the city is a complete shitstorm right now, and everyone is looting everything. This totally reminds me of big times in history when great empires fell, like the fall of Rome. The Vandals, the big Germanic tribe, sacked Rome and made off with some of their greatest treasures, just like people are making off with the Earth Queen's greatest treasures. That's where the term vandalism comes from. It was during the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. After the government collapsed, Europe entered the Dark Ages. That's just the period in real world history between the fall of the Roman Empire and the beginning of the Renaissance. The big question to ask is, is this the path that the world of Korra is on? There was no Zaheer in real life, no one person that just crushed Rome. It was a long gradual process. The answer to all that though was the beginning of the Renaissance. The word Renaissance means rebirth. It was a period that started after the creation of movable type and you know easy fabrication of paper. It became this big cultural movement all over Europe that led to a new age of creative thinking, art, culture, and society. So rewind to where we are in Korra right now. We're at the fall of Bossing Say, implying that the world might be entering the void, so to speak, entering its own dark age. A period of chaos that Zaheer's trying to create so that society will rebirth itself and usher in a new renaissance of spiritual enlightenment. That's why I love the character so much. That's why I love Zaheer, just because he is so crazy, but his logic is solid. It's what would totally happen. People would find a way to thrive no matter what. The Hundred Year War led to the rise of Aang and a new age of peace. That was like a minor version of what Zaheer is trying to do. He's trying to burn the field so that new crops can grow stronger than before. We don't know anything about Book 4 right now, so we have no idea how far his plan is going to progress. There were a few surprises during the Mako and Bolin escape from the city, mostly Grandma. She is glued to that picture of the Earth Queen. I hope they explain whether it's because she's stuck in her ways or if she has some sort of special connection with the Queen. It's possible that they included that scene just so that they could get that funny moment with Bolin throwing her over his shoulder like a sack of potatoes. Moving on to number four, Suyin in the Metal Clan. Couple of big red flags here. First, if you have seen any of my previous core videos, you know I totally do not trust Suyin. And there's the possibility that this clown person in her circus group was Zaheer. That's not confirmed or anything, but the minute Suyin said, let's bring an army of highly trained metal benders all loyal to me, I felt like Team Korra was headed for disaster. Suyin totally feels like the kind of person that would drink Sahir's Kool-Aid, someone who's really into the idea of a renaissance. It's possible that she's totally genuine. I don't think she's going to be solid good or solid evil. She seems like a Zaheer apologist, but you can let me know if you agree. If I were Lin or Kor, though, I don't know that I'd feel comfortable taking an army of metal benders into battle that I didn't know were absolutely loyal to me. I did really like Suyin's armor though, that was really cool. Before the metal bending artistry that we saw this season, Lin putting on her armor in the morning was one of my favorite metal bending sequences, just her getting her Iron Man swerve on. Speaking of which, I know a lot of you feel like Bo Lin might learn to lava bend instead of learning to metal bend. It seems like if you can master one difficult form of sunbending, you could totally master the other. They're both earth forms. Usually it's a psycho-spiritual thing. I know major forms of bending are tied to lineage, but subbending isn't some midichlorian bullshit genetics thing. I would be so upset if that were the case. I don't think that Mike and Brian would troll the fandom doing something like that though. On to number three, Korra meets Iroh again. This was a nice surprise, a bit strange with the timing, but very welcome. Especially that they paid the moment off with Zuko later. I'm surprised that he would be surprised Iroh was in the spirit realm. You'd think that Zuko would have reached the level of spirituality that would allow him to commune with Iroh, but I guess that's not the case. Really what was going on is that Korra was trying to call Zaheer out using his own methods against him, but instead she ran into Iroh. In case you missed it though, there was a big Last Airbender reference. The advice that Iroh gave to Korra about finding things you weren't looking for was the same advice that he gave to young Zuko whenever they were hiding out in Ba Sing Se. 
I always love it when Mike and Brian bring Last Airbender moments into the new series. The whole meeting with Iroh is a little out of place, but think of it as like a vastly shorter version of the Iroh episode from Book 2. Korra needs a lesson from Yoda before she flies to the Death Star to face Darth Vader and the Emperor. And when she did talk to Zuko, I feel like he was telling her Aang would have died to protect the Airbenders. He backtracked a little saying that Aang had a greater responsibility to the world, but an alternative take on the scene is that he was implying Aang would have killed Team Zaheer if faced with the choice. Even though killing is one of the greatest taboos of the Air Nation, you could also use that logic to say that Zaheer is not a true airbender if he's killing people. Thus, the shit starts to hit the fan. Number two, Team Zaheer versus the Air Nation. The animation and fight choreography on the whole Air Temple part of the episode was so above and beyond anything I'd ever seen on the series before. I love the animation on Avatar Wands episodes just because they were so unique, but inside the normal core episodes, this is the new king of fight scenes. I know I made some Star Wars references to Iroh and Korra earlier, but it only makes sense that my mind would jump to Obi-Wan Kenobi when I think about Tenzin. It's like his scene with Zaheer, his fight scene, was Obi-Wan Kenobi fighting Darth Vader in Episode 4. They gave him that same type of pan away ending that they gave to the Earth Queen, so if she's dead, it seems like they want us to think that Tenzin is dead too. I'll follow up on that in a sec. But I was also really happy to see that they let Kai take on Ming-Hua, the Combustion Bender. I totally did not expect the downer ending, so I actually thought that he was going to take that airship down whenever he took her on, just like Lin took down the airship during book one. It's a children's show, so I totally understand why they showed us him surviving with the baby air bison rescue. I think if they had cut that scene, then the episode would have had a lot more dramatic weight, but I understand that if they had made kids think that Kai had died, Nick probably would have gotten a million angry letters from the parents of crying children. I know a lot of the fandom isn't a huge fan of Kai, so be honest and, you know, no judging here, would you have been okay with Mike and Brian killing him? Like letting him officially die in the fall? I would have been okay with it, but again, killing children is not something you see on Korra. At least, I can't remember them ever killing a child, at least in an explicit way. Jet from Last Airbender is one of the few exceptions, but technically he was not a little kid. He was older than everyone else on Team Avatar. And the killing continues onto my number one WTF moment, Team Zaheer kills Tenzin. Can we all agree that the show at least wants us to think that they killed him? I'm sure all will be revealed in episode 12, but until then, given the way things went down with the Earth Queen, Tenzin has left this mortal coil. Enter the Void totally feels like a metaphor for death now. Since that's the title of episode 12, but it's not the finale, I'm really curious if Korra is going to have a major out-of-body adventure in book 4. At this point, the best theory I've seen so far is that Sahir wants Korra to refuse Rava and Vatu, which creates a whole mess of logic issues based on what happened during Book 2. But if Zaheer's already accomplished his goal of revolution, what more could he need Korra for that he could not do himself? He does need the portals to be open, which they already are, so I don't think that it has anything to do with the connection of the spirit realm and the physical realm. He could be trying to reset things to pre-Avatar wand status, meaning he has to kill Korra while she's in the Avatar state. That would end the cycle of the Avatar. If that happened, I suppose Rava's connection would be severed, and I don't think that Rava would cease to exist. Let me know what you think that Zaheer's plan for Korra is, but here is the logic issue that I was talking about between Rava and Vatu. During the Book 2 finale, Rava was wiped out, reset to her zero state. Under normal conditions, she would have re-emerged from Vatu in 10,000 years. No matter what story the show presented in the finale, you can never kill evil or good, absolutely. They'll always exist. They're fundamental states of existence, it just using the terms evil and good are our subjective ways of describing them. You can call Rava and Vatu something else, but neither one will ever be completely destroyed, they just get suppressed for a period of 10,000 years. So in the finale last year, Jinora just forcibly sped up Rava's re-emergence. So you can influence their cycle, you cannot stop it. More to the Book 2 finale, I take issue with the fact that Avatar 1 separated Rava and Vatu. If that were true, then there would have been no part of Rava inside Vatu for Jinora to extract. That implies that they were never truly separated. It's a big problem that I'm trying not to overthink, but let me know what your opinion is on the issue of Rava and Vatu, and if it has anything to do with the Book 3 finale. Overall, I just gave this episode a solid A+, for killing a beloved character, or not being afraid to kill a beloved character, and doing it with the best possible animation. A+, is all around. The Lin and Su Yin scenes in the airship dragged just a little. Iroh felt a little out of place overall, but everything was totally amazing. One of the things I did notice is that they seemed to rush a lot of the core portions of the episode. Like the real action of the episode was up at the air temple and they just rushed through the core parts so that they could get to that. 
The Iroh last airbender moment was totally adorable, even if it made Zuko feel like a bit of a space cadet. The way he was presented in the Korra universe, as I understood, was that he was the new Iroh, like he had achieved a certain level of enlightenment in the years since the formation of Republic City and retiring as the Fire Lord. I think they just wanted a funny callback, so for all intents and purposes, Zuko is Obi-Wan Kenobi, just like Tenzin is. And Zuko calling out his daughter so clearly in the episode makes me feel like we're definitely going to see her during Book 4. They wouldn't go four seasons teasing a character and not sure. I do wonder why we haven't seen her yet. It feels like seeing who she is, you know, physically seeing her, will reveal the long-standing mystery of Zuko's wife. Like, who did he marry? The best theories I've seen so far are my, but I'm not current on the comics, and I know the comics did reveal some possibilities about Beifong's husband. Or one of her husbands. So just to address the book 3 finale, Janet Varney and some of the cast were talking a little bit about how it was different. They just said that it wouldn't be a big spiritual battle like seasons past, meaning Korra will not have a giant fight with Team Zaheer. She's probably going to sacrifice herself and literally enter the void of death. It just seems like everyone important is dying this season. There is a Korra book 4 that will be aired on the website just like the episodes are right now. Janet Varney is the star of that, so even if Korra enters the void of death, she is not going to die completely. Like, she's not going away. That brings up more questions than it answers, but I'm going to wait till after episode 12 to start speculating further on book 4. In the meantime though, congratulations to this week's giveaway winner, Li Cheng, you win the Amazon gift card. I'll be messaging you on your channel for details, so be sure to check your inbox. While we all try to get over Tenzin, click here to learn about the Star Wars Episode 7 villains, and click here for last week's core video. Thanks so much for watching, I'll see you guys tonight, high fives.